Hi, Steve Hayes here, and welcome to Days Are Getting Better, episode number 30. In today's episode, I talk a little bit about a blog that is in the newsletter on being an imposter. I'm going to speak a little bit about personalization and what we're learning there, and maybe a comment or two about how that might apply to issues of neurodiversity, diversity of other kinds and to data that are emerging from around the world. I want to maybe mention a couple things that are coming soon in MindGrapher that are linked to these uh, developments. I want to talk about a cool uh, free summit from a good friend, Mavis Sai. Uh, and announce a kind of exciting new form of media that we're going to produce uh, here at stephenchayes.com. So all of this and more on this episode of Days Are Getting Better. I'm going to talk just a little bit about being an imposter. Many of us are, most of us, and I think secretly almost all of us, are one point in our life or another bothered by that issue, feeling as though we're secretly just pretending, or if we're found out that it would be pretty bad, feeling as though we're not being authentic or genuine, and feeling a sense of shame about that. It's a secret. Despite how broad, how broadly it's shared, in fact, it is often held as a secret. People don't easily share the information because the mind tells you that you only get out of this box that you've been put in when your concepts about yourself and who you really are line up with your aspirations. Unfortunately, that very system, buying into that idea, itself inhibits the ability to develop competence, or to take its benefits when you even have them. There are people who are competent at amazing levels who still feel as though they're an imposter. In the blog, I walk through some sort of signs about that and things you might do about that, but I wanted to focus on something that I came across digging into the etymology of the word genuine that I think is kind of sweet and maybe suggest something that you might do. It comes apparently from a, a Latin word that means knee and a very similar sounding word that may have come together that means to conceive or beget. And the etymological idea might not be right, but it's uh, supported by some information is that the Roman idea of, or method or tradition of recognizing parentage by a father putting a child, or parentage may have been questioned, on his knee is kind of a, uh, an acknowledgement of genuineness. I can relate to that sort of from the inside out. I had fears about authenticity and genuineness in high school and beyond and graduate school. And I remember one early insight was the realization that the things that I do are being evaluated based on the impact they have. And I'd put myself in a place where I'd be almost mad if I got an A or I was mad if I got a good grade on a on a paper because I'd be thinking, you know, if, if you know how little work I did on that, you'd give me a D. I should get a D because I could have done so much better. And then just kind of accepting that, well, there's also just how you did, not just the story that you tell. And then the real transformation came in the early days of ACT where I realized that what I was running from was this set of self-doubts and fears 
and the fear that it'd be rejected if they were seen. I can have compassion for it. I mean, I can go back and look at my own childhood and that little kid who was eight going on 38 in a home with loving but deeply disturbed parents who I feared would literally maybe allow us to die because they were so into their drinking or OCD or arguments and so forth. And feeling as though I had to put a face on. How are things doing? Oh, fine. Because I didn't want any further investigation of that question. So I have heart for it. But on the other side of the act work, I found a place to put that self-doubt and fear on my knee and to own it as having emerged from my history in my context and I was not going to reject it. I was not going to push it away. I was going to allow it to come with me. Maybe not a little bundle of joy. Maybe it's a bundle of self-doubt and fears, but it's still my bundle and I could take it with me towards a journey of greater and greater competence, knowing I'm never going to be fully competent to the level that my mind can give me as to what would earn my place as part of humanity, but I can respectfully decline the invitation for that to be the game, to own and take on the parentage. Okay, self-doubt, come on with me. Okay, self-fears, come on. And in that way, I'm no longer being an imposter. I'm being a whole human being learning. And uh, the fears and self-doubts are themselves genuine. Bounce them on your knee. I'll let the blog do the rest of the speaking there. I want to speak a little bit about personalization. I'm seeing a drumbeat of articles now on ideographic personalization. Not necessarily lining up to our vision, it's in MindGrapher and PsychFlex, of doing this inside processes of change, especially not those that we discovered in the so-called Death Star study, are the similar processes that account for almost everything we know about how change happens. Not many people seem to be on that yet. But they're definitely on a personalization, and here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing sort of meta-analyses and experimental studies, and one after another after another they show that if you take the chains off, you allow the clinicians to provide things that are fitting the needs of others, and it sounds as though, or it looks as though in the early studies, that especially important is not just giving people the choice over what kind of therapy when it's one size fits all or something. No fitting the kernels, the elements of what we do to the needs of the person in front of us. Now, I think when you combine that with processes of change, it elevates it massively, but we're not there yet. Data-wise, we will be soon. And Cyflex and MindGraph is part of the reason it exists. is because I thought it's so important to get there and had to create a system kind of ecosystem where it would even be possible to get those kind of data and do those kind of analyses. But we're going to get there. And there's another element here that I've also noticed, a couple of recent meta-analyses on function, functional assessment, functional analysis, showing that if you target with interventions what is functionally important, and now we're getting darn close to what we mean by processes of change, that you get better outcomes in single case designs targeting that person and across the meta-analytic literature. So I feel like we're on the cusp of something pretty big here that is really going to change what we do in which every voice matters. It's something you've heard me say over and over again. But if you're an empirical person, having that land in which every person deserves to be measured and modeled in their own terms before they're collected and combined and compared with others. And then allowing those things to happen if and only if we can hear the note of that individual voice even more clearly. That's what we mean by idiomic. Individual, ideographic, 
and then nomothetic, the generalization that occurs at the level of several. So it's exciting times, and uh, who knows if people in the long run are going to say, you know, that the team we've assembled here, really central to it, myself, Stefan, Joe, Belgender, Cristobal, others who are doing this kind of work. Does that really matter? But I'm definitely seeing the change happen, and I think you will too if you just kind of look around. Um, there's a little drum beat that's happening. Think of what could happen if we could actually do that. For one thing, something like neurodiversity now is assumed. Everybody's different. How about differences across culture or families or communities? We just published something recently showing that couples are different, not just individuals. Groups are different. What about being able to move around the world? in ways that are respectful of lower and middle income countries and what they have to contribute. And the most exciting thing, and this is what's in MindGrapher and PsychFlex, in my opinion, is that now the attention shifts from the big randomized trials only in the Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic universe, the weird population. You've heard me say this before, but you know, the. 10% that's producing 96% of the psychology literature, and then we call that universal. No, we need to create a situation in which clinicians on the ground, practitioners on the ground, clinically, behavioral health, social justice, I mean, behavior changes of all kinds on the ground need to be the source of the information about how best to read the individual needs, the functional needs, the contextually determined needs of an individual, and how best to give them the elements or kernels that they need. And, you know, we're way ahead of that in the ACT uh, world because we've been at it a long time. I've got an event coming up of my last lecture in May 22. A bunch of my students are coming, 32 of the 57 PhDs that I produced. A bunch of others, friends and colleagues and so forth, here at the university. And uh, in that context, I'm looking back at some of the stuff we did, and I looked at the title of the very first PhD that I granted, Rob Settle, 1984, with a study done by E182 at the Center for Cognitive Therapy. Well, not at the center, but with the help of Tim Beck of the Center for Cognitive Therapy in Philadelphia. And what does it say in the title that it's about? The Components and Processes of CBT. including components and processes that become act. So we've been at this for a long time. Uh, I think uh, longer than almost uh, anyone. It, pridefully, I'd probably say than any of the major alternatives that are out there, although behavior analysis and so forth have been out there for a long time, but in terms of the specific kinds of things that we do. So uh, it's exciting to see an era now where What's going mainstream are things that have been there in this tradition. So if you're part of it, I hope you're feeling excited as I am. And I hope you consider, uh, you know, making that leap. I say it over and over again. I'm sorry if it sounds like a broken record. Go into psychflex.com and picking up PsychFlex and MindGrapher. There's some really awesome tools that are coming that are right inside these new articles. We just published another one that, you know, a, a cognitive research and therapy on a large set of different studies showing the same thing we're seeing over and over and over and over and over again, which is that normative perspectives on processes and outcomes are lying to us. You have to model them 1% at a time. And so... Uh, if you really want some help in doing that and see some exciting things that are coming just within the next few weeks, I hope you consider it. I decided to do a shout out for Mavis. She's got this awesome uh, summit on love, courage, and its role in the healing the world. And uh, Mavis is the co-developer of FAP, Functional Analytic Psychotherapy, with her late husband, Bob Kohlenberg. 
one of my first students, fathers, Barbara Kohlenberg, and a real fellow traveler. And they came to every single Worldcon. Uh, and uh, we're down now to just the one or two others other than me that have been there. But Bob used to be at every single one. And um, so I, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Of course, there is some money if you want to keep it permanently to check out these talks. That has to be done because you need infrastructure and recording and all of that. And the money goes to a, a charitable foundation that made this run. So let me recommend it to you. A final thing I just mentioned at the beginning, gave a hint about, is there's a new thing that's happening in our media here at StephenCHase.com, which is a, a new program called Flexible Conversations. And the first one will be Flexible Conversation. Stephen C. Hayes with Franz de Waal. Franz died just about five weeks ago. Wonderful man and a friend of contextual behavioral science. He recognized some important things that we were doing in CBS, an evolutionary perspective for sure, but also respect for the data from non-humans. And what he was known for was really pushing out our understanding of cooperation and fairness and comparison and some of these things which language amplifies, but which are core to the life history uh, of development, the evolution of uh, creatures on the planet of all kinds, big and small. And uh, so I recommend you to check that out. It's there uh, in uh, the newsletter. And if you're seeing this on a YouTuber X or something, look for flexible conversations and uh, click, click the like button and I think it'll come to you naturally when we create a new one and we've already got another one that's been shot with the late Og Lindsay uh, the first person to ever say the word behavior therapy and uh, a couple other really wonderful ones uh, coming up so there'll be a little drum beat of them going forward just fun flexible conversations and we'll for no purpose other than learning and having fun with our colleagues around the world who are thinking and doing interesting things. So with that, I'll call it a wrap. Days are getting better, number 30. And uh, peace, love, and life. Until the next time.